Welcome to Trial by Wine. We take a closer look at crimes that highlight how fascinating humans can be. Schmitty, Swanee and Clarkey visit crimes and run them through their jury of three, debating both sides of the case to agree an appropriate, if totally fictitious, sentence. Please be advised, Trial by Wine may include explicit or disturbing content and will include drunken rambling. Listener discretion is advised. All right. How are we? <laughs> very well. well, very well. Long yes. time no see. Yes, it's been, been a little while. It's been a few weeks, really, because we had that other Carla Swan who did that interlude show that may or may not make it to the air, uh, <laughs> while the real Swanee was uh, gallivanting around Rottnest. Swanning around. Yes. That's right. How'd you go? Was it good? Yeah, we were only there for um, two nights and we went up to Singapore. Oh, so well, that's, that's where I've been, darling. I was going to say, hang on a minute. <laughs> no, you're no, only no, away no. two nights, and we've been away no, for three went, weeks. No, there were sort of back-to-back trips, though. So we went across to Rottnest. And that was lovely. Well, it wasn't so lovely going there and back. We had a fiftieth to go to, uh, so there was accommodation booked and obviously a party. But the day that we had to travel over, it was not what you call a boating day. Right. And likewise, the day that we came back was not what you'd call a boating day. Bit uh, choppy. Just it's it's not a particularly nice crossing, I don't find. And on days where, you know, Perth is incredibly windy, it can yeah. be a real rough ride. And mm. it's it's not terribly pleasant and uh, it makes me a little anxious. And overall, I was calling myself Kay Cotty. <laughs> okay, no, I'm not Kay okay. Me and the kids getting across and back. It's like, oh, we made that. So that was well very done. nice. And then we just went up to Asia for... Uh, a just week and a bit, just before the kids went back to school. Yeah, well, we haven't been since before COVID, so we go up there and have a bit of a dumpling fest and go and stay in a nice hotel with a nice pool and do a bit of shopping, just a bit of a, like a city kind of break with some nice food and they're just, just different from here, just a change of scenery. And it's quite easy to get up to, obviously, from Perth. We're in the same time zone. Yeah. So that, that helps us a lot. Yeah, that's what we've been doing. Just to finish off the school holidays, to spend a bit of family time together. So everyone's back at school now. Yay! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. What have you pair been up to whilst I've been gallivanting? Uh, well, I've been working and pre-wedding prep. I'm very well, much looking forward to yeah, It's a bit of a countdown now, really, isn't it? I know. As of mm-hmm. tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to write a run sheet, for God's sake, just to calm everyone <laughs> down. I mean, honestly. Anyway, we, ha- we had I'm, to do that too. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, really? I'm seeing the caterer tomorrow, and I'll sort. And I had to send the celebrant, the caterer, the groom, and my wedding coordinator the run sheet. Isn't that someone else's job? Isn't that why you have these people under control? So that's me. That's what I've been doing. Boys, what about you? What have we been doing? We uh, Elton John. Probably, yeah, we did go and see oh, Elton John, which was good. That um, must have been like the second or third last concert he did. I did see you guys post about that. Yeah, yeah. So it was really good. Um, yeah, we, was we it enjoyed his, that. Was it his hits or was it his classical stuff? Because I once uh, got sucked into a classical one thinking. It's everything, yeah, isn't it? it was yeah. a lot of his hits and there were about three songs in the middle that I was just like, what on earth is he playing this trash for? He was but playing either some... side of those were amazing. And it was fabulous, and totally sorry. unheard of, and I just yelled out at the back of the NEC in Burning, Birmingham, Benny and the Jets, Benny and the Jets, the whole night. I was a bit drunk at the time. Did anyway. you get there late? Because he normally starts with that. But he didn't do any of his hits, that's the yeah, point. Right. It was some when was philharmonic that? Years ago. thing. Yeah. It was years ago. I went with Lorraine and another friend, um, right. a work connection, and they said, oh, we'll go see Elton John. It was up at the NEC in Birmingham. We drive all the way up and we have a we get there and we expect the hits and we get yep. philharmonic oh, orchestra and classical Sting. stuff. Oh, nice. And had my husband yelling out, Roxanne, well, Roxanne. Oh, yeah, you know, Jeremy did the same thing. <laughs> but with, I think we saw Elton John um, at the Stones. end of 2019. He made it to Perth yep. before COVID and then it, it got whipped out. So I, unless it's changed massively, which I think it probably hasn't, it felt like he left nothing. He gave it all and went, there you go. Yep. There's every song you're going to want to hear. You're not going to say that I haven't given it my all. And we thought it was brilliant too. I really enjoyed yep. it. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. Yeah. This was our second farewell tour we saw him. Oh, did you get to do it before as well? Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't remember the first one. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went to the tennis, which was good. And then last week was a long weekend with Australia Day, so... Oh, that's nice too. It pays mm. to belong when you live in Melbourne and, or, or surrounds, doesn't it, when you can pop down there to a bit of Australian Open and stuff. That's great. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Lots happens in Melbourne, as you know. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Anyway, that's us. Who are we? I'm Schmitty. 
I've forgotten who I am, but I think I'm Swanee. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Clarky. And together we are Trial, Trial by, by Wine. wine. Nice. nice. And speaking of wine, what are we drinking? Go on, Swanee. You know oh. you are. Take it away. Cut Lead from sugar. the top. Coke no sugar. <laughs> no way. I uh, know. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Coke no sugar. Um, so enough. we're doing a 28-day fitness challenge at the gym for... Um, I hope you started it a few days ago. We did. Yeah. Just as well. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, in just in time for a certain... Just in time for a certain... Oh, yeah, don't hen's worry. night and marriage that you're yeah, not allowed no, to be no. fitness freaks at, yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's all fine. Tonight we're drinking, oddly, a bottle of ginger lemon kombucha. Oh, which is actually quite tasty. So we'll, we'll oh, drink that it. and then we'll see how we go. We'll have it in wine glasses. Yeah, we'll yeah. have it in wine Very glasses. Very civilised. What about you, you Schmidt? Are you, you enjoy, holding the fort? You enjoy your fermented culture. <laughs> you enjoy <laughs> it. <laughs> I sort of am holding up the fort. I'm drinking a damson gin and a diet Well tonic. done, darling. Yes. Good. In a tub, I well glass. played. What's the active thing in the kombucha called? A scoby or? Um... Scabies, I think. No. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me. Yeah, there's some name for it. Yeah, yeah the culture. Right. There is some word for it because every now and then you get, you see people on Facebook say, Does anyone have any of the blah blah? And they're talking about the culture so they can breathe it. Oh, their they own have kombucha. the little things, yeah, that they then brought from. I don't know. I'm buying it in a bottle. Yeah, fair enough. It. Fair enough. Well, would you like to hear a story? Would, would I ever like to hear a story? Mm, okay. T- tell me a story. Take me to another land. I will. I'm going to take you to another land and another time. Although it's not super historic, it's sort of within our lifetimes, The some of the story is. Uh, but the other land that I'm going to take you to is the United States of America. Mm. Oh, I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> so the story I've got for us today has some parallels, well, a few, with you and Woo, Clarkie. So I thought you might find it interesting. That's nice. (laughs) My sources. (laughs) Sorry, listeners. (laughs) Oh, there there aren't that many, but there are some parallels. My sources are allthatsinteresting.com, thedailymail.co.uk, medium.com, atlantamagazine.com, findagrave.com, and not to give anything away, (laughs) thechurchofsatan.com. Is that that the bit that we've got in common? No. So, without further ado. We would be more um, Church of the Poison Mind anyway. You know, the the Culture Club song? I don't. That's more our speed. Anyway. What I was going to say is that when I get on to the satanic part of it, actually, yes, there probably are some parallels and there probably are things that you will find that you relate to and it will all become clear in a moment. Can't wait. Charles Scudder was the son of Charles Morrison Scudder and Eleanor Edith Lee. He was born in Watosa, no, Wauwatosa. Wauwane? How, how do you say Wauwatosa, I think it is? Wauwatosa, Milwaukee County, You're telling Wisconsin. the story. W-A-U-W-A-T-O-S-A. How would you say that? Wauwatosa, Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, on the 6th of October, 1926. Anyone else want to give a bid on how I to I was thinking it? Google Translate would tell you that. No, no, no. It's one of these funny Milwaukee slash Wisconsin names. Yeah. It's anyway, just again, it it's really not important. So he okay. was born in Wauwatosa, Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, on the 6th of October, 1926. In the 1940s, he studied at <laughs> Wauwatosa. Who did that? Wauwatosa. There you go. Siri. You're right. Thank you. Wauwatosa. There we go. Wauwatosa. Wawatosa. With an English accent, Wauwatosa. Yeah. What a tosser. In the 1940s, he studied at Oberlin College and was involved with the school's drama program. He took one of the lead roles in his school's 1945 production of Candida. He married a woman he'd studied with at Oberlin College, Helen Kilburn Hazlett, on the 10th of September 1946 in St. Joseph Berrien, Michigan, USA, Illinois. But the marriage soon ended in divorce. In the early 1950s, he married, what is it with these names? Burtai Bunting, the daughter of, a, of Brit- <laughs> Burtai Bunting, the daughter of British modernist poet Basil Bunting and Marion Culver. They later separated after having four sons, Saul Scudder, 
Gideon Scudder, Fenris Scudder, and Ahab Scudder. Where are these names coming from? Mostly the Bible. Are they? Apart from right. Fenris, all of his sons had biblical names, yes. I've never heard of the other one. Where's Fenris from? That's what I said, apart from Fenris. All the yeah, others I know that, but have you heard of Fenris before? I looked it up. Oh, sorry, I looked it up. It's a Norse word for wolf. I couldn't really work oh, out gosh. where he got it from. Goodness. Yeah. Apart from him, Fenris, all of his sons had biblical names, which I thought was a bit ironic given the faith that he identified with. He was a Satanist. Wow. Mm. Even at that point. Yeah, yeah. But I go on to explain. Now, before anyone jumps to any conclusions on that, he wasn't really. <laughs> oh. He was a staunch atheist and had an academic interest in the occult and was certainly not practising devil worship. He had a few trinkets around and was a paid member of the Church of State, Satan, State, whoever that is, the Church of Satan, which was established by Anton LaVey, who, by the way, also played the devil in Rosemary's Baby. Little uh, bit of information there for you. He mostly wanted, uh, Carla's like, what? Yeah, me too. Famous horror film. Famous, famous, awful yeah, horror it, film. Yeah, but- yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got um, Rosemary. No, yeah, Rosemary. The short, lady, the short and hair. And a baby. Rosemary's played name? by not Mia Red, Farrow. Mia Farrow. That's right. And I've seen it. And at the same it. time that she was doing that, I think if this is you and your pop culture, I mean, mine's only yeah. good to yeah. 1970, right? I think the same time she was making that, she was actually dating. Can you believe Frank it? Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Yeah. Correct. And they yes. broke up because he didn't want her to work anymore after that. So she she said, "Piss off." There you go. A little bit of. Uh, Pop culture, I suppose, maybe popular back in the 70s. Uh, He mostly wanted to live life on his own terms, believing that he should be able to enjoy life's pleasures without feeling guilty about it. More of a hedonist, really. Others described him as a kind man who wouldn't hurt anyone, let alone commit any form of animal or human sacrifice, which is obviously the popular idea of what a Satanist gets up to on a Saturday night. And he trusted others to respect his feelings, which was pretty naive, all things considered. In 1958, while raising his four children, Charles employed a younger man, Joseph, who was always known as Joey Odoms, as a cook, a housekeeper and assistant. And I read some hit where that um, Joey helped out with the kids as well. Unlike Charles, Joey was not highly educated and identified as a Catholic, but the two fell in love and became inseparable. Charles was a student of Loyola, Loyola University under Dr. Alexander Katzmar, after graduation, he became the associate director for the Loyola, Loyola, I can't say it, Loyola University of Chicago Institute for Mind, Drugs and Behaviour and worked as an associate professor. In an interview years later, Karx, Kar, how did I say it before, Karzmar described his former student, friend and colleague as being quite eccentric. At times he dyed his hair purple or red and kept a pet monkey. He bought a mansion on West Adams Street in Chicago and filled it with Baroque furniture he had bought from when the Bulban and Katz Chicago Theatre was liquidating furniture. He was also an accomplished harp player and had been invited to play with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, which I think is a pretty big deal, actually. He was described by his peers and friends as brilliant, polished, quiet-spoken, but confident. By the 1970s, Charles's surviving sons, because the youngest passed away and I couldn't find out any information on that, but he was about 13 when he died. And I think some of what I'm about to talk about might have been triggered by the fact that he was grieving for his son, as in, like, not in a major way, but it was, it was a factor in his decision making. By the 1970s, Charles' surviving sons were grown up, though he and Joey were still living in the mansion on West Adams Street. Charles had a very good job at Loyola University, but in 1975 he was over it and decided to move out of Chicago and seek a simpler life away from taxes, bills and the helpless feeling that resulted from watching my old neighbourhood disintegrate into an urban ghetto. If you move out of town, do you get away from taxes? Well, you do if you go off grid, which is what he does. I don't work. I don't know about taxes, actually. I, I can't speak to mm. that, but probably he's talking about income tax. Anyway, he had inherited a small sum of money, which made him think about a different way to live. In his own words, in such a melancholy environment, which we may talk about the, ma- the mansion in Chicago, it was no wonder that I suffered along, no doubt, with many others from continual hankering, vexation and apathy. But then I inherited my little income and I thought, I want out. Oh, man, do I ever want out? I just, you know, I figure he's got an American accent. On the 17th of December, 19th, and also it was the whole old man thing because I was like, oh, yeah, man, because it's 1975 and, you know, I want out, man. 
<laughs> On the 17th of December 1975, after several months of searching for land throughout the southeast, Charles bought the southeast quarter of Lot 248, 6th Land District of Chattooga. Oh, why did I pick? Why do I pick things I can't pronounce? Chattooga County, Georgia, for the sum of ten thousand five hundred dollars from John S. Cooper of Floyd County. And in nineteen seventy six, on his fiftieth birthday, Charles resigned from the LUC and moved with Joey to Chattooga County, Georgia, in order to live a more simple lifestyle in the mountains. Oh my God! Of the Chattahoochee National Forest. <laughs> How many places you. do you reckon you've mispronounced? No, I think you, it's right. Do you want to untie your tongue? It's not easy, you know. Uh, no. Chatter, C H A W T A H O O C H E, Chattahoochee. How else would you say it? Chattahoochee. Chattahoosh. Maybe. Just throw it all together. They were sort of early off gridders and they built a castle like house of Charles' own design on top of a mountain. The house was done. Wow. Yeah, it was. Well, this is the, now the late 70s? Mid 70s. 76? Yeah. 76, when you say yeah, his yeah. design, 76. was it like a crayon drawing of a castle? And then so when they built it, it looked really bad? Or Yeah, look, I've seen it, it. And I've got to say, I wouldn't have looked at it and gone, oh my God, that's amazing. I thought it was a mm. bit shit myself, but um, <laughs> 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 just different style, different aesthetic. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but when I go on to explain how that happened, I think they built it pretty much by hand on their own. So it's pretty impressive in that respect. That is. The house was dubbed Corpsewood Manor in honour of the way. Corpsewood Manor? Mm hmm. Oh. In honour of the way the surrounding trees looked when they arrived that winter in the middle of a blizzard, no less. Charles wrote an article about the house, which can be found at MotherEarthNews.com. So I thought I'd quote some of it here. So you get a sense of him and the house, which was this major project for him. So this is all in Charles's own words. The only person I really had to consider before making a move was my loyal friend and housekeeper, Joe, who for 17 years had cooked for me and my boys and cared for the mansion. He'd been in trouble with the law once and had only a fifth grade education, but he'd learned far more about the world than I had with all my degrees. And somewhere along the line, he developed a talent for whipping up meals fit for a king. It seemed out of the question for me to ask Joe to move to a pretty ticky-tacky house in the suburbs because he seemed to have an inherent dislike for anything modern. Probably why he was going out with a 50-year-old bloke at this point. He even kept the cords of our few electrical appliances tied in knots as if to choke them. My <laughs> companion also insisted on using iron skillets and old ironstone platters in his kitchen, confessing once that he'd always wanted to cook on a wood stove. Furthermore, I knew I could never live in an apartment, a dwelling, sorry, a type of dwelling which I consider to be only slightly better than a prison. On that, I've got to agree. I'm not an apartment liver. So I wondered, where shall we go? What shall we do? And with my little inheritance providing the necessary impetus for change, I made up my mind. Why not make a clean break now, I concluded. Why not get back to basics? Be poor. After some soul-searching conversations with Joe, I decided that we really needed to find some place in hilly country with the glamour of four seasons but without super cold winters, with a good supply of pure water and wood for heating and cooking, and most important, with the measure of isolation. After years of enduring the sensory overload of city life, I desperately wanted to be situated where I could neither see nor hear my neighbours. So I moved to Indigo Valley. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> There's the parallels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I studied geological survey maps of southern states. That's where Carla comes in with the geology, <laughs> uh, not geology, ge geography, geography, and wrote to the presidents of local realty boards. One such person answered that he had 40 inexpensive acres of hardwood trees in the Appalachian foothills, completely surrounded by national forest land. Does sound idyllic, doesn't it? No. The word Appalachian the, yeah. makes me feel slightly uncomfortable. Nothing good yeah. happens. Yeah. yeah, that's right. What could go wrong? Yeah. Yeah, if you hadn't was... said Appalachian, I wouldn't have picked up on anything. But yeah. yeah, it's funny you say that because I've got this romantic. I, I know exactly where you're coming from. But remember the Wendy Matthews song. Wendy Matthews song Appalachia. Yeah. Love it. And it's beautiful. Yeah. Same. Oh, I and every time I hear the know. word Appalachia, I think, oh, isn't that lovely? You know. And then yeah. I remember all the horrible murders and. Things but also that the bit she says in there that but all her dreams were an old man's memory. Because yeah, it's not he quite told all these wonderful stories about it. But it doesn't actually... exist like that anymore. True, true, yeah. true. I figured that the cash from the sale of my city property 
plus my retirement fund and the money in escrow would allow me to make such a move, so I drove down to Georgia to take a look. There I found hummingbirds, whipperills, butterflies, bobcats, great oaks, fungi, and rolling mountain woodland. I was hooked. Fungi. Fungi love fungi. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real selling point. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird thing to say, isn't it? I found fungi. I had to move there. It's an it academic. Pretty remember. outstanding. Yeah. It's an academic. Uh, I'd also whilst- call it fungi. But you can. I'm calling it fun guy because it's funnier. Because uh, he's, he's a theatri- fun guy. <laughs> the theatrical coming out in you. It is. I just thought it was funnier. Uh, while still lecturing, I bought the land, had a well dug 160 feet deep, planned my house and bought a little camper and a Jeep. Then in 1976, on my 50th birthday, I resigned from the school, auctioned off all the furniture and possessions I didn't care about, gave away all my electrical appliances, sold my property and arranged for a moving company to take charge of the things that I wanted to keep. Then Joe and I, plus my two English Mastiffs, who by the way were named Beelzebub and Arsenath, left for our kingdom. (laughs) Cutting ties that have taken a lifetime to form is a draining experience and throwing away professional security and all its supposed conveniences and luxuries is like losing a piece of oneself. But for me, the change was like crawling out of an old, outworn skin. What an exhilarating, unsettling and strange rebirth it was. Joe, the dogs and I left the city during an icy blizzard. We lost our way several times in the course of the trip, couldn't find the property when we did reach the area and spent the night parked and lost. And after we had finally <laughs> after we'd finally located our new home site, the storm grew worse. Dead Horse Road, and this is my mm. note, which they named as when they pulled up there was a dead horse in the road, oh which was their God. driveway. Yep. Uh, our winding logging trail driveway disappeared completely. For the next few days, we were alone and stranded in the wilderness and had to begin our new life by melting snow for our water supply. It's like something out of Naked and Afraid. Like he sort of writes it in this kind of, oh, ha, ha, this happened, but it must have been awful. Anyway, just saying. It'd be awful driving down Dead Horse Lane to get to Corpsewood Manor every day. Oh, the horse was cleared. I think the horse belonged to a neighbour and it just dropped dead. (laughs) But they called it that. No, it wasn't called Mm, that originally. Same with Corpsewood. They called it that. In the blizzard-bound quiet, we faced up to the incredible amount of work that loomed ahead and the fact that we had much to learn. Our first task was to list our priorities and to make necessary purchases. The most important buys were the chainsaw, (laughs) a two-wheeled dolly, a small concrete mixer, a garden cultivator and a kerosene refrigerator. We'd already picked up a wood stove at a flea market in the city. Yeah. These and all of our other possessions, which the movers eventually brought to the foot of the mountain, were put into temporary storage under plastic sheets weighted down with stones. Then he goes off to talk at great length about how they built the house. And it's not easy, so I'm going to slip some of it. They dug a toilet, privy day he calls it. They managed to get the water, to uh, the pump to work. That was water day. Using only hand tools, we dug the excavation for the house's foundation. Can you imagine that? Honestly, anyway, lined but it with I do, bricks. I do see in movies, you know, they dig holes. Like they dig a... It's not 1876. It's yeah. 1976. Mm. Yeah, but like the, I don't know. I don't know whether there's actually any truth to it or it's just um, music, uh, movies taking poetic license. But sometimes I try to dig a hole here and I literally can't tr- dig a shovel can't deep almost. move. That's right. And people dig six-foot holes in no time. Dig graves, for God's sake. If someone yeah. said to me, dig your own grave, I'd be like, oh, well. How what long else? you got? Oh, what, what other options? Because... I'm happy to give it a go, but the, we're both going to age while it's going. Yeah, while I'm that's trying, right. the I'm going to die of old age trying to get my <laughs> own not... grave dug. Yeah. Yes. So he goes on to say they lined this house's foundation with bricks, filled it with concrete and boulders. We used forty-five thousand bricks to raise the walls of the house, placing them three layers thick with two-inch wide air spaces between the layers for insulation. Even so, the cost was quite low and the results pleasing. Though I'd never laid a brick before in my life, now I'm starting to think of what's that one with Kevin McLeod? She's talking to grand you. Grand designs. Grand designs. Yeah, That's I think it's thing, a <laughs> very <laughs> early grand design, isn't it? What did you say his name was? Kevin McLeod? It's close. That's not quite right. I don't know. I can't, it's not coming to me, but I think that's not quite. Yes, it is starting to sound like that. 
and then we have to string it out over several months and several years. Well, because if you're digging it yourself. Exactly. So then they finally put a roof on it, roof day, and he talks yeah. about they <laughs> created. If you like um, it, then you should have put a put roof, roof on it. That's what I was thinking. That's exactly what <laughs> came to my mind. But it's in the second year, to your point, Carla, about it going on forever. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're living in a, like, a, I think a little camper or something most of yeah. the time. But in the second year, they put a roof over our two upstairs bedrooms, which are reached by a circular stairway that's illuminated by my own stained glass window, which, from what I read, featured some satanic symbology in it. And of course, we celebrated Foundation Day, Beam Day, and at long last, Roof Day. It's amazing that their first house build, they were able to build a two story house. I think it's three story. I think we'll get to that. Is it? Yeah. I, I mean, now place. if I had to do that, I'd Google it to see if I could do it. But I don't know how you just rock up somewhere and go, all right, let's just whack this together. Well, this is an article he wrote for Mother Earth, Earth News, right? I reckon there's probably a fair amount of planning that went into this before they just got there. Because remember he talked, mm. it took him over a year before they actually he quit the job and moved. So I think yeah. he must have been planning it. But I agree with you. If you've never done any of this sort of work before, it's extraordinary. I don't know what about Joe, though. Joe could have been extremely handy. Joey, sorry. Mm. Within two short years, we were living in an elegant mini castle. He then mini goes castle. on. Mini castle. Yeah. He it's goes like on the McMansion is a mini castle. <laughs> yeah, it's a mini yeah. castle. <laughs> goes on and to talk an about. An elegant McMansion. <laughs> goes on to talk about his vegetable garden and where they grew everything, basically. They use many homegrown and foraged food products for our meals, most certainly be a among the best in the world. After all, as Joe instinctively knew, nothing compares with wood stove cooking. Uh, in fact, we lived in a grand style on a little over $200 a month. Of course, we have no electricity, no phone, no television set, but we don't miss those things. We also have no electric bill, no phone bill, no water bill, and no fuel bill. We owe no one. This morning, for example, I picked fresh raspberries to go along with our whole wheat pancakes. We grind our own flour from wheat that we buy for $7 per 100 pounds, and honey from our beehive served as syrup. Then I weeded, pumped water, and went about my other chores. At 10 a.m. we had tea in the gazebo, and I designed a new chicken house that I plan to start building soon. Tonight I may practice my harp, or perhaps I'll just sit in the courtyard and listen to the tree frogs and whooper wills while bats fly and the clouds drift across the full moon. The world that's around me now is fresh, quiet, and very beautiful. Oh, that's nice. Then he raves on about um, some other stuff and it, it, effectively he then says, you know, give it a go, be a rebel, don't assume that your life is uh, nine to five. Just promise me that you'll think about it seriously for a while. After all, wouldn't you like to live in your own kind of castle in the country? What a lovely story. Is that the end? <laughs> no. Good on him. And they all lived happily, happily ever, ever after. That's a really nice story. I think it probably belongs more on Grand Designs, as you said, but how tidy that. Well, good on him. Well, I think good it's on a him. mix between. Uh, when's the crime? Off <laughs> gridders. He's a bit of an off gridder, Grand Design, naked and afraid, prepping. You know, he's, he's got some I like way, he's, got you know, he's clearly a very, speaks very eloquently as well. He's got like an interesting turn of phrase. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. So basically they were tree changers like Clarky and Wu. And though I do appreciate the fact that you have running water, electricity and a flushing loo, that's, that makes a big difference to it's, me. Yeah, yeah, it's much better if you come to visit. The stained glass yeah. window that um, yeah. Clarky did, though, is a very dear, very close parallel, of course. Yeah, it's we did bad. have to take that out. The satanic spec. Our religious <laughs> friends were getting offended. offended. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now, so on that chicken house that he was planning to build? Yes. Yep. Here we go. What do you what do you envisage when someone talks about a chicken house? Well, we built one and people say it's quite grand, but it's off the ground and then has walls all over it and a roof and a little ramp thing to get up. And if you were to say square meter each, how big would you call it? Oh, ours would be, I don't know, two and a bit by two and a bit, yeah. maybe. Hmm. Did it have a chandelier in it? No, it did have, but Sia swung from it and it <laughs> oh, fell. I ask you that because we had family who had um, a house just outside of Perth and they yeah. had a, a, a chicken coop, is that what you call it? Yeah. That's what um, normal people call it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, and they had a chandelier in it. It was just really? a quirky thing. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, it wow. Was just, yeah, nice. Chickens loved it when they shat on it. Yeah. Um, That's quite cute. This thing was three stories high. Adjacent to the house, oh. 
And the bottom, having looked at photos of it, I would say the bottom is more like three metres wide, five metres long to the house and made of brick. And then it's Staggles. got two stories above it. But the chickens were only downstairs. They were on the ground floor. Yeah. Um, and then they had food storage in there as well. So it was partitioned off for food storage and some chicken. Second story for canned goods and pornography. And the third was for the <laughs> pink room, not the stink room. Was that a joke? No, they called it the pink room. The, the joke was it wasn't a stink room, but it was called the, the pink room. The pornography room wouldn't be so no, good, would it? It wasn't how a did joke. You access, was there like stairs between them? Like how big was it? Are we just crawling up there? I'll get there. Did, tell me they didn't go up there and then re- We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll watch get there. porn and jerk off over their chickens. Oh, the oh. chickens were multiple floors down and there was a good separation for semen flow, so don't worry about that. <laughs> now... <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm just going to get on to probably a bit more about the um, cultural context of the US at the time. So I don't remember this being a thing in Australia in the early 1980s, but maybe you guys do. It was a thing in the USA, um, the whole satanic, satanic panic thing. Do, did we? Yeah, I don't maybe. remember. Really? In Australia? No. I think everywhere it would have been. I think when we were at school, it was something you probably heard people talk about a little bit and it just felt incredibly taboo and because it was starting to come out more in music and things, I think. It was in film. It was in, in culture, film and stuff yeah. like that. You know, what it was is it? Kind of- well, basically it's a his- mass hysteria. So there were gross-out films like The Exorcist. Interestingly, yeah. in 1974, Dungeons and Dragons had come out yeah. and kids were really into that. And, you know, we talked about that in an earlier episode when we were talking about Stranger Things, talk, you know, yes. making a reference to it. But quite honestly, priests and parents were terrified that kids were going to become possessed if they were playing Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons. And oh. I, I'm sure, Swanee, you see signs of that when you're hosting. I've got to go and check. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> when I'm hosting it. Yeah. I don't know enough about you're it. You're worried about all the wrong things, Swanee, but if it, you're not but it worried is, about like, that. I, exactly. Do you think it's it sort of, for me personally, I'm just saying me personally, I'm not talking to the US or to yeah, Australia, yeah. but I certainly remember in the 80s we had a period of time in our life where for the first time things were coming into our home on TV. video. Oh, yeah, video, well, no, yeah. we were members of the library we had to vo- borrow the videos from That's right. and then it would come with the cover art and I'd be terrified of, you know, when a stranger calls or the omen or whatever else. I didn't watch them but they were in our house. My parents were watching films like that. Um, Children of the Corn, like all of these. Yeah, there was, yeah. This really was a real horror shit. moment. It was. It and was I think it was accessible in a way that it never had been. Yeah. You know, if kids went to other kids' houses, you were watching. Well, I wasn't. I was a little bit younger. but I didn't watch I it either. Never, never that person. But lots of people loved horror movies. It was all about horror movies. and yes. horror, It's a shock. Horror, horror. And a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, never liked any of it. In that never respect. watched no, it. I've never liked it. Yeah. Either. Neither. It still did. terrifies me. No, I really do think I could imagine that there was definitely this sort of it was. It was yeah, called the Satanic was Panic to, and it was a yeah, big I've thing. I've never heard that but I, I'm not surprised yeah. actually because it was just in like it was coming into our lives in oh, a way I that it never had right. before. I think there you're right. There was a lot of through, music through as well. Music and movies and stuff, yeah. I don't, I, can't, I don't know when Michael Jackson brought out Thriller and that but it was just mm-hmm. a, it became a. Again, setting early 80s, yep. So at the same time there was a conspiracy theory that McDonald's was funding satanic enterprises to the point where they released a statement saying that's a load of old shit as well as a book called <laughs> Michelle Remembers where a woman tells the tale of being caged, tortured and sexually molested by a bunch of Satanists. And to top it off, Poltergeist came out in 1982, which scared the living oh. crap out of everyone. So yeah, yeah. there was all of this stuff going on. But also in the late 70s, there were the Atlanta child murders, which we haven't covered, but you guys remember you've watched Mindhunter. There's a reference, that I think, in the last second series, they, they kind of are covering the Atlanta child murders. And over 25 black children were murdered and one of the theories was that a ring of homosexual paedophiles were responsible. Makes sense. (laughs) Though Wayne Bertram Williams is largely considered to be the killer. And in the early 80s, HIV first made its first appearance, being called a gay disease, and for some odd reason the US broadcasters started to link Satanism and homosexuality. Oh, I've not heard that. Well, I think that's where... The satanic panic was much more of a shared hysteria in the US than in Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So back in Corpsewood, which is so <laughs> badly named, but anyway, <laughs> Charles and Joey, who were the only gays in the village, were socialising with some of the locals and the manor became a bit of a social destination. 
but people, the locals were suspicious of these two guys on the hill. So some of the people would go up there, but they would talk about them being homosexual devil worshippers, even though they were their mates who were going up there. To and invites an invite. Them. Invites yeah, an invite. Meal. You get a really nice meal. He's a good cook. It's like go to Clarkie yeah. and Woos. You know, they are homosexual devil worshippers. but have got the best that, wine. Yeah. Apart from that, they're very <laughs> good. good fun. That's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Until someone, until the devil arrives. Does something yeah. terrible. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Summons the devil. Yeah, summons the devil. The Bob. Hey, boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so they're guests with these incredible meals prepared by Joey. Uh, who was an amazing cook, and, and they made a nice homemade wine and everyone would drink that. Tea cakes. Cha- no, but Charles would play his harp for entertainment. Like soap. No, no, they weren't doing anything really, as I said no, before. But- they have like an Indigo Valley orgy kind of situation going on after they prime them all <laughs> I haven't, haven't you, Have you been to one of them yet, Swanee? I'm, I'm still waiting for my invite. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's well, funny you should the next say one. that. It is <laughs> funny you should say that because after dinner. Everyone's got a bit loose. They would adjourn. To the pink room, which was the third story of the chicken house. It required a person to climb up a ladder to the sparsely furnished room. So the only entrance was like a very narrow, I'm picturing a trapdoor basically. It had a few old mattresses and a load of porn in it, as well as a journal for guests to record their experiences and sexual preferences. Basically, they were having liberated, consensual, sexual good times. But, of course, the local gossips twisted that to be that they were gay devil worshippers having sex parties and probably doing all manner of unspeakable things. I reckon that's a normal stereotype for back then, the gay devil worshippers doing all the crazy shit. The devil worshipping bit, though, too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Just lump it all together. And the thing is, I mean, he didn't help by saying he was a Satanist and having some satanic paraphernalia around because I think he thought it was funny and he was just basically making a point which was, I'll live my life the way I want to live my life. Thanks very much. It's none of your business. Yeah. And perhaps it wouldn't have been such a great narrative in the local area if he didn't have that. But otherwise they were just a loving couple living a quiet, isolated life off the land, building their own lives enjoying each other just the you know perfectly fine should have been left alone to do it and sharing their except for the pink room well look let's put it this way charles was 50 right so he went through the sexual liberations of the 60s and 70s he also i think you know he married twice i don't know the man but i'm going to assume that he was kind of out finally in this situation and and they have built the exploring. room within the castle? Did they have yeah. to well, do it's it interesting you say It's a smell. I don't like the idea of where it is. It's I just two think, floors yeah. up, could, though. I don't could, think you can smell the chickens if that's what you're worried bullshit. about. Bullshit. I just think, and the, the, <laughs> you know, All the effort that dynamic having, lifter. Oh, my Lord. The, yeah. Having to crawl up into it. I mean, couldn't they have just made a little bit of a, you know, a sunken lounge room kind of yeah. den or situation? That would Kevin be Kevin McLeod would have said, yeah, exactly. Kevin McLeod would have said, can we have a sunken lounge? I guess I don't know where you're going with this. It's like I think you're making it too difficult for your guests to have to crawl up an external staircase and into a trap door, you know, to get their jollies. I think maybe but we could do something inside. No, because they actually didn't do any of this stuff in the house. It was only in the oh. pink room. So it was like a psychological separation for them to say, we will do anything in that room. Like no, all, no holds barred. Anything goes. Go yeah. for your life. Anything goes. You're consenting and... What have you, also, but- you've got to really want to do it because it's not easy to get to. That's yeah, right. And yeah, you've got yeah. to tolerate the Didn't dynamic lifter. You have to have to get yourself in there. That's right, you know. <laughs> and so, and the oh, dynamic lifter. Oof. Gross. But it was this kind of the rest of our lives is quite pedestrian and, and normal. So, um, well, you know, just normal. I keep using the word normal when I don't mean normal. I mean suburban, you know, like just or whatever. They just were hanging out, not having sex orgies in the rest of the house. So It's an opportunity gone begging, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in 1982, Avery Brock, a local kid, had wandered onto the property hunting. He and Charles Ooh. met and Charles gave him permission to hunt on the land. Over a few months they became friends and Avery joined them in the pink room a few times. Oh, Jesus. How old is Avery? 17. Ooh. Mm. Avery told his friend Samuel Too Tony young. West, who called himself Tony, about the guys. Now, Tony was a bit older. He was 30. And he'd done time in jail and mental institutions. I think uh, Avery, by the way, had been abused by his father, had a um, 
he, he'd had a bad and rough upbringing basically yeah. to get him to this yeah. point and i'm not sure but he might have also had already had altercations with the police so he tells this guy tony who was older that he who had already done time in jail and mental institutions about these guys on the mountain so, of course, Tony and, and uh, Avery decided that the guys on the mountain were rich and it'd be a great idea to rob them. On the 12th of December, 1982, Tony and Avery invited two other friends to go to the manor. And these were two teenagers, a girl and a boy. The two ten- teenage friends knew nothing about the robbery idea. They were completely innocent. Had Tony been, do we know if Tony had been to the... Um, no, he hadn't. He had so it was just no, Avery. So Avery, Avery him told him about it. Yeah. Ta- Avery consentingly went into the pink room as far as we know. He was telling Tony about whatever he'd done in the pink room and later on Tony basically uses that as an excuse to be an arsehole. And maybe Tony, you know, did have serious homophobic issues and what have you, but Avery was quite happily engaging in consensual sex with these chaps. So Avery himself may have been gay for all I know, right? Well, bisexual anyway. Uh, anyway, so the two teenage friends knew nothing of the robbery idea and had heard about the pink room and the parties and had nothing better to do, so they said sure. So they all piled into Tony's car and headed up to the manor. Once they arrived, they were warmly invited in because Charles and Joey were extremely hospitable. You know, they were just genuine, generous guys and they liked the company and, it, you know. Fresh they, meat, in. fresh meat. No, I don't, it oh. wasn't always about that. Oh, <laughs> Anyway, as you say, after dinner they went up to the pink room. As you say. Where they spent a few hours drinking and enjoying a can of tootaloo, which is basically a mix of alcohol, paint thinner and glue for sniffing. (gasps) What was that? Really? Tootaloo, it's called. Toot-a-loo. Makes you toot on the loo, I'm sure. Yeah, fall off the loo. Well, it's like kids, you know, who used to, what did they call it when they used to blow in air? Chroming. Chroming, yeah, because they get the... Yeah, it's the same idea. Uh, All those brain cells gone. I just remember when I worked at McEwen's and then Bunnings, you know, we had to have all the paints behind us on the counter. And if a kid came in and bought a can of spray paint, we were instructed to slash the plastic bag that we gave them. Oh, so that really? they couldn't, yeah, with a with a little knife, so that we they couldn't blow it up and chrome in it. I didn't know it was called that, but I do know. Yeah. Well, it's because they used to get a chrome ring around their mouth from the bag because the because oh, of the God. pain. Yeah, it's disgusting. Yes. I'm sure it's not good. Anyway, so what was Tudelu a mixture of? Tudelu was a, a alcohol. And I'm when I say alcohol, I'm going to assume something like ethanol, like it, mm. like right. not a little bit of rum, you know, because you just <laughs> drink that, right? So it's alcohol Moonshine. paint. Paint thinner and glue for sniffing. So a nice mix of things that can get you high. They really and do so they know how to look after their guests, don't they? Yeah, no, no, yeah. they didn't produce it. Avery brought it with him. So oh, right. That's, that yeah, sounds yeah. more, yeah. Charles- that sounds like an Appalachian cocktail to me. <laughs> <laughs> Appalachian. Yeah. Yeah, Appalachian anyway. good time. <laughs> well, they were having sexual good Appalachian times, high. Yes, well, they were having an Appalachian cocktail, let's put it that way, that Avery had brought with him. And then Charles did join them upstairs in the pink room, but he didn't do the toodaloo. He just drank his own homemade wine while Joey cleaned up after dinner because Joey was very domestic. Then a, a couple of hours later, Joey, uh, sorry, Avery said he needed to get more toodaloo and went down the ladder. When he came back, and here's it, this is when it turns very dark, all right, so strap yourselves in. When he came back, he was holding a rifle. On seeing the gun... Charles, probably a bit pissed at the time, said, bang, bang. But the mood turned sour. <laughs> well, he was just sort of joking around, He'd like, yeah. you know, whatever. But the mood turned sour when Avery grabbed him by the hair and pressed a knife against his throat. Demanding to know where they kept their money, Charles said, we don't have any here, it's in the bank. Avery tied Charles up with a bed sheet and then descended the ladder and stormed toward the main house in search of Joey, who he shot four times at point blank range as well as the two English Mastiffs who were sleeping by the fire. Aww. Didn't speak to him, nothing, just walked up and shot him. No reason, just... Well, they were robbing them, but there was no need to kill anyone. Mm. Avery then forced the teenagers, who were probably thinking, God, that escalated quickly, because remember they <laughs> went there for a good time in the pink room and to see if there mm. were any drugs and alcohol. They were not expecting any of this to happen. Mm. Avery forced the teenagers down the ladder and into the house, and Charles as well, sorry. And, and sorry, Tony's here the whole time. Avery's sort of driving this, but Tony is also aggressively interrogating Charles. When he saw Joey, 
obviously dead, Charles reportedly pulled away from his interrogators to kneel next to his beloved. His last words were, I asked for this. Avery then shot him dead. In a rather macabre foreshadowing, Charles, several months earlier, had painted a self-portrait. It depicts him seated in a chair with his arms bound and a gag in his mouth. His face, which is a mask of sheer terror, is riddled with holes. In reality, he was shot five times in the face. Oh, God. Yeah, it's awful. Then Avery and Tony ransacked the house. They grabbed some bits of junk because there wasn't actually anything of value in the house and they threw them in Charles's Jeep. And then they took, because Charles, the only thing that probably looked valuable was this large, you know, harps. Harps are big, right? And yeah. it was gold. And I'm going to say it's painted gold or it might have been brass at best, but it wasn't the golden yeah. harp from bloody the golden goose from the giant's <laughs> castle. I mean, these people are stupid. Anyway, they tried to take this harp outside. Well, they took it outside, but they couldn't fit it in the Jeep. So they left with the teenagers and went back to their salubrious accommodations, which you probably guessed was a trailer. There they with threatened the that, no, I don't think they, they couldn't fit in the Jeep. They had to leave it behind because they were stupid. There they threatened to kill the two teenagers if they said anything and they took off on the run, intending to go to Mexico. On the way, wanting to de- dump the Jeep and have something less noticeable, they ambushed Kirby Key Phelps, who was sleeping in his car. I think it was a he was an army lieutenant. They forced him out, and when he tried to run, Tony shot him dead. Mm. So now they've killed three people. Four days went by, and a friend dropped into Corpsewood to see Charles and Joey, only to find the inhabitants dead. He went straight to town to notify the police, who arrived within the hour. They found the house ransacked and bloodstains on the walls. Those who searched the house that day described the crime scene unlike any other. Satanic statues and paintings, whips, chains, a woman's wig, pornography, vials of LSD and human skulls. Um, any truth to that? Yeah, some is. Yeah. yeah. They were just eccentric. Like none of these things are actually a big deal, really. They human weren't... skulls. So I, sp- I spoke about his education at the beginning, but they believe that he took them from the university where he'd worked. He was a zo- zoologist and a pharmacologist and finished up doing... And a human s- skull collector. No, I think, you know, like, I know it sounds weird, but you know how you've got skeletons in science labs? It would be a couple of, like, skulls from that. He, he didn't go to a grave. He, he hasn't done anything weird with them. He, it was yeah, really yeah. just a scientific thing that he thought was quirky, you know? Yeah. So he's taken them. But again, that's what I'm saying. The way that this was... And it's one of those media stories again. The way this went in the media was actually all about vilifying the victims and not about worrying about the reality here, which is two innocent people who'd been nothing but generous to their community had been slain in their homes. And I shall continue to paint that picture for you. Word of the slayings began to spread. The Atlanta Constitution reported on the story on the 18th of December with the headline, Slain Devil Worshippers Were Ex-College Teacher Companion. The article quoted McConnell saying, it's a very bizarre murder. I think McConnell was the investigator. Uh, The gentlemen that lived in the house were devil worshippers. We're a very small town and we had known about that. That's just freedom of religion. However, apparently the local police had wanted to arrest them but but couldn't because of freedom of religion. So they weren't, oh, we knew about it and it was fine. Oh, no, they were not keen on it at all. But and as I said, they weren't actually devil worshippers. They were more hedonist yeah. root rats, you know. Of course, the press loved the story of the gay devil worshippers making a fuss of their sexual proclivities and some of the paraphernalia recovered at the scene and more disgustingly yet, and I have seen these, some papers printed the gory crime scene photos. I don't rec- oh, recommend really? you. Oh, yeah. They're still available online. I, I wouldn't look at them. Meanwhile... Avery and Tony had a fight and Avery tried to hitchhike home because he's so bright. With a gun? No, I think they dumped. Did Tony have the gun? Okay. I don't know if they still had the rifle. I don't know if they they killed the other guy with the rifle or another one. (laughs) No, but, you know, I wouldn't put it past this pair. (laughs) Um, One of the teenagers also went to the police. So the female teenager, I can't remember her name, she basically had been harassed and terrified and told you can't go. And I think... Her boyfriend was related to Tony West. It was yeah. his name was something related, and so I think he was saying you can't you can't go to the police, can't go to the police. But obviously, a few days later, she's like, no, this is terrible, and she and must so. have been haunted by yeah, what she saw. Yeah. So she went to the police, and it was coinciding with when they found the bodies. 
I think so, yeah. But her testimony, though, allowed them to immediately work out who it was, right? So they issued the arrest warrants for Tony and Avery. Avery nearly got home, though, just south of the county where he called his mother, who told him about the warrant for his arrest. So he then walked to a petrol station and told the attendant that he'd killed Charles and Joey. The police were called and he was taken into custody. Tony made what? it to, he basically, he gave himself up. His mum, he right. spoke to his mum mm. and she said, right. they know you did it. There's a warrant out for your arrest. She probably said the best thing for you to do right now is to come clean. It. Come clean, yeah. yeah. And so he just walked so get to get off your sister and go to the police. <laughs> Probably the nearest place that he could get a phone call made was the petrol station. Mm. Tony made it to Missouri before changing his dumb mind and headed back east. On the run for a bit, he ran out of money and energy and gave himself up because he's an absolute criminal mastermind. Unsurprisingly, the media were less interested in the perpetrators and more interested in victim blaming. The Atlanta Constitute quoted as saying, Scudder and Odom were described by authorities as homosexual devil worshippers who lived in a dank castle-like home, cluttered with skulls, pornographic materials, an extensive occult library and statues of Satan serpents, lizards and frogs. So now that's cluttered with skulls. And remember I said he was a zoologist, right? So he's got yeah. serpents, lizards and frogs. So what? You know, like mm. anyone who collects that sort of stuff from a labor, you know, from an interest perspective, that doesn't make you a Satanist either. No, but, but I you're right. They build it up. They build were, it up. Yeah. But what you were saying about the 80s. Two human skulls. That's what he had. And he had a, I don't know if he, he had gargoyles. He thought it was funny. So he put some yeah. gargoyles up on the house and he did have the stained glass window. All this other stuff. Oh, he definitely had porn. They definitely had porn. Yeah. But all this other stuff that they start carrying on about is sensationalised. Yes, you're saying about the 80s. Well, I reckon the the things around um, snakes and frogs and all that kind of thing, you know, frogs give you warts, which is what witches have and, I reckon snake, you know, come back to that whole serpent thing, Adam and Eve. I think there's links between those things and Satanism. And of course, that's nonsense. I mean, I think the whole thing. Well, that's how nonsense, witches but... are made. They suckle off the teat of the devil. See? In the, Jesus, in the pink room. Right? <laughs> <laughs> While having tutti frutti or whatever. Where do you think their power comes from? Their power comes from the devil. This is. It's where, it's where the I gay's it... power comes from, too. <laughs> No, I think it, but what what I think probably there is a, a greater cultural historic thing in America, in particular, when they when the Puritans went to America, and then you had all of that um, witch, trial. witch trial, yeah, and Halloween, and this this concept oh. of spirits and witches and stuff, which we didn't really have so much. The kids are mm. now getting into it because it's a, just a fa- it's just a fashion thing, but we don't have that same kind of history no. of fervent belief in that sort of stuff and I think that's probably to your point Clarkie that we're talking about cultures of people who've heard this story these stories over and over again about witches and blah 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 and so probably lean into it more than we would yeah and I think um conservative and very religious societies Mm. would absolutely think that you know there's, there's all the talk of sin and and those sorts of things which push you into that devil worshipping space pretty quickly so so i think if they've got all of the other bits and pieces in as well they're ticking all the boxes yeah i i do think you know if if child and i think when he said i asked for this it's almost in his final words almost like he recognized that he didn't ask for it of course no one asks to be mm. shot in the face five times and have your partner slain and your dog slain and your house you know ransacked but kind of i invited it almost by not on purpose but i've invited this to some degree anyway by february 1983 legal proceedings were underway brock admitted to killing odom and was sentenced to three it was the dog pushing the door open, but I'm like, oh, I just talked about witches and shit, and then the, yeah. door, the door just Got very you. slowly opened. <laughs> By February 1983, legal proceedings were under, underway. Brock admitted to killing Odom and was sentenced to three consecutive life terms, so that's Avery. Tony was charged with murdering Charles but pleaded innocent. According to case material, West claimed that the murders were an act of revenge for the embarrassment suffered by Avery when he had allowed Dr Scudder to perform oral sex on him during an earlier visit. The case summary continues. At trial, however, Tony contended the the crimes were the product of hallucinations resulting from Dr. Scudder having spiked their wine with LSD. Forensic analysis of the wine bottles revealed no traces of LSD. Mm. Also, Ah, I read in some accounts, and they were scurrilous accounts in my opinion, 
that Charles had taken 12,000 doses of uh, LSD to Corpsewood when he left Chicago. I don't even know how much that is, but that seems like an outrageous amount of LSD to be taking, right? It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot for someone to have to count too. And I don't carry. Know how, I mean, if it's, is it by drip? So I don't know what else. I don't know how. I don't know how it's a tab. A strange number. Twelve thousand yeah, tabs. Like that. That's like a packet of what's the snow? Do you remember the washing powder that was it Lux that came yeah, like these what little was that? Yeah, flakes? Yeah, flakes. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> maybe twelve thousand doses of LSD is as little a tabs. It's just a couple of boxes of Lux. Yeah. In fact, maybe he only had a couple of boxes of Lux, and they just said it was LSD. Yeah, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> his ex boss said he was pretty anti drugs, which doesn't surprise me, given he it was his academic field of study. He was actually looking at the effects of mind altering drugs on people. Yeah. His attorneys also claimed Charles had bewitched their client, who had seen his golden heart pulsing with an evil glow. What? <laughs> Nuts. Throughout the, I think they probably were on, well, they were on Toodaloo, right? And I don't know what that does, yeah. whether it's hallucinogenic. And there's nothing to say that they hadn't taken other stuff before they arrived. The pulsing harp. Oh, oh, I love a good golden pulsing harp. Pulsing harp. Throughout the trial, of course, Tony's attorneys made homophobic insinuations, but after several days of testimony, the jury returned a verdict of guilt on all counts. And West was sentenced to death. Not having the right number of women on the jury led to a retrial for West, which resulted in his guilt being reaffirmed. During his second okay. trial, he was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. Avery and Tony remain in Georgia prisons to this day for the murders and have been denied parole multiple times. Charles's ashes were taken back to Wisconsin by his sister Janet Scudder Arnold, where they were buried in the family plot on the 25th of April in 1983. Joseph Odom, whose life had revolved around Charles and the home they built together, was cremated and his ashes spread at the garden at Corpsewood Manor. Corpsewood Manor is a ruin now. Um, it's fallen into great disrepair. The chicken house burnt down sometime later and people go there and call it haunted and make a fuss about it. Yeah. But now, as you know, I did use some of the information as I quoted in my sources, which was from the Church of Satan, and I'd like to finish with a quote from that publication in point of fact, from one of their high priestesses. This is a cautionary tale for every Satanist. Walk among them, but never forget you are not of them. And that is the tale of Corpsewood what? Manor. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for you know, the clarity, love. <laughs> she wrote this long, long story and, and her her account was like she had some of the information in there, but mostly she was trying to really underline the fact that he was a Satanist but a really good guy. And you read other accounts and people who knew him well and they were like, yeah, he had a membership. He, like he paid the membership for the church but he was just sort of vaguely interested in it. He, he wasn't attending anything or doing anything. Anyway, that is the tale of Corpsewood Manor, Dr Charles Scudder and Joseph Odom who in this day and age where people are a little more open-minded, I'd like to think and imagine that they're still tending their garden, raising their chickens and bonking the locals. With consent, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Interesting. Mm. I must say I'm surprised at the sentences in, in a good way. That never happens. Mm. With What's the first one, Avery? Just... Three life sentences. No, that was Tony because Tony said he, was, he tried to plead not guilty. Avery, I think he's got life though, but he pled guilty immediately. I thought you said three for him and then um, the other, no, Tony got was death for, and then three, right. Tony sorry. got death and then I think that got commuted to three life sentences. Yeah. But they're both in prison without and they've been denied parole. And this was, yeah, 1982 and we're talking so 40, wow. 40 years ago. Yeah. So they've been in jail for yeah. 40 years since, yeah. yeah. Which I think is okay but also he robbed two perfectly innocent people of their life. Three, actually. The the other guy in the car, yeah, yeah. completely minding yep. his own business, having a nap, mm. probably trying to get somewhere, home or something, you know, was had his car stolen and was shot for no reason. So, you know, they were brain-dead animals, basically, a pair of them. Yeah, who saw an opportunity or thought they saw an opportunity and so. And that's the weird thing. Like if you see photos of the house, even when they're in it, it doesn't look like the house of a super wealthy person. But that's it's the relative not a trailer. state of the house. Yeah. True, true. <laughs> Compared to yeah. where these people have come from, yeah. anything would seem. I suppose yeah. you've got a golden um, harp and it's glowing at me. So yeah. Oh, I know, right? Yeah. Mm. That must be it, yeah. I think judiciously or if the ju judicial system did the right thing, 
Mm. I don't like that the press did what the press does, which is say, here's a story we can sell if we take this angle. And oh, yeah. even now in the All That's Interesting and various, I think it was the All That's Interesting one that I didn't use because it was all about them being Satanists and all, you know, and sex parties. And it's like that was a very small component of the life that these two gentlemen lived. A man who was the father of three boys was killed. Families are impacted by this. And this, this whole kind of press carrying on about, oh, this will sell if we just talk about it as homosexual, paedophile, sec- you know, like oh, just all this cool. shit, just mm. shit. And the reality is two people were murdered in their home, their dogs were killed, which I never like it when the dogs are killed to it. And these were apparently this pair of dopey mastiffs wouldn't have heard a fly, you know, they were not guard dogs. Mm. It's just a completely senseless and sad crime. And in my mind made worse, perhaps the only reason I know about it is because of people, you know, still carrying on about it, but it just denigrates the the memory of the people who were lost. It, it doesn't sound like that's you know there's a, a hate crime element to it, or you know, I thought at one point it might have been that because they were Satanists supposedly that it was a religious kind of the thing. Only, but it, the it only just sounds like an that, opportunistic. I think it was. I think it was. Look, they've got money, and mm. um, Tony tried to blame it on the fact that he was angry yeah. that Charles had performed oral sex on Avery a few yeah. weeks earlier, which, frankly, I reckon Avery got the better end of the deal. I don't see, you know, why you'd be upset by that. Any holes a goal, <laughs> eh, guys? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, not a female one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But you know what I mean, like a, like a, that whatever. Like if if he thought that his young friend had been taken advantage of, or you know whatever, but he didn't race in there in a fit of yeah. anger and accuse yeah. them or anything like that. He took his time. It was a plan. They were there to stay for dinner. Yeah, yeah I, I don't doubt that he um, was comfortable. Could have well been them. homophobe too, but you oh know. yeah, yeah, no, and, and I don't doubt that. So I don't, I don't doubt that you know after everything else, he was quite comfortable killing. The two of them um, Avery for killed no them. good reason. Avery right. killed Sorry, them. Sorry, Avery killed them. Tony killed the guy in the car. Yeah. So the, the, the killing, though, was senseless. And so potentially there's some undertone there of not liking them, whether that's because they're gay or because he's just an arsehole, who knows. Um, mm. But it doesn't sound like it was a you know, predominantly hate crime. No, I don't. I don't think it was a major hate crime. I think it was more. Oh, yeah, as you say, crime of opportunity. And yes, probably fueled by. I don't know whether they thought they'd get away with it or have more sympathy because these guys were homosexuals and uh, satanists. Yeah, or just didn't give a shit. They're on their tutti frutti and. Yeah, they didn't really have much of an escape plan. They they came back. They didn't run. Mm. They were like, um, mm, oh, too my hard. Mommy. Didn't think that bit through. Mm. But they didn't think any of it through. No. So, what will you do to them? <laughs> it's a hard one because I think they've had done to them what they deserve. And that rarely happens, right? I know. We're normally it's, going, it's... Oh, outrageous. It's like, oh, well, okay, fancy that. Both of them seem to have got, and the fact that they're still they're in still jail. In there. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know yeah. if we could do, outdo that. Yeah, I reckon that's not too bad. I can. Oh. Yeah. I mean, they, they could be on the third floor of the prison with the chickens on the ground floor and no floors in between. And the dynamic lifter, exactly yeah, what I was yeah. thinking. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, paint their cells pink. It, yeah, yeah. It'd be, it'd be, yeah, that's right, and show gay porn or something just to razz them up a bit. <laughs> I think it's really about how do you make the prison less comfortable for me rather than how do mm. you do anything yeah. more. Yeah, it's a good point. I remember once when I was a lot younger with a friend of mine, we watched some gay porn because we were curious, and I remember her turning to me, as in male gay porn, not lesbian porn. I remember her turning to me going, oh, there's just too many dicks, you know. Which is- <laughs> 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 so maybe they'd have that reaction. Oh, oh there's just, it's just too, too many, many dicks. dicks. I can't deal with it. Yeah. Too many dicks get <laughs> me out of, of here. Yes. Yes. Too of many doodles. dicks on the dance floor. Too many dicks. Yes. <laughs> That's a, a flight of the Concords. Anyway. Uh-huh. I don't know it. Sorry. It's just that they go, to a like par- they go to a party and it's all blokes yeah. and so they're complaining. So they have a little song about there's too many dicks <laughs> on the dance floor because there are no females. I like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I reckon a bit of a nice a nice 
I don't know, 15-year layer of dynamic lifter. You know when you go into some scuzzy place and pigeons have been shitting there forever? Yeah, and this is yeah. Just this huge amount of it. And yeah. I think that they need to be sort of maybe suspended over that dynamic lifter and they can come up out of it so they get a nice bit of fresh air and then they're pulled back into it. Maybe there's an opportunity for, you know, Airwick or someone to come up with a air freshener that is Gwyneth dynamic Paltrow. lifter centred. Gwyneth Paltrow. She's got a ca- she made a, ca- a oh, yeah. candle about it that smells like her vagina. She could so do a candle. Did she really? Like- yeah. Where have you been, Clark? Yeah, I How know. could you not I'm know that? Oh, we don't know that. Face. If, if there was a <laughs> oh, 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 if there was a Google that, I'm like, what the fuck, mate? It's if actually was... called that. What? what? It's called of my vagina smells like my vagina. Yeah. And oh it's like goop. Lord. It costs a lot of money. 80 US dollars. Yeah. What? I'm not buying yeah. one for you. No, we I don't want one. I think, I think it was like a, it was so popular that it was sort of like now if you had one, you'd probably be able to sell it for a lot of money or something. You're joking. Wow. I don't know, but I don't yeah. know if they sell it anymore. Collector's item. It might be. about that? Yeah, I don't I normally click on anything. Maybe they do still sell I have a feeling they don't sell it anymore. I could be wrong. Oh, I mean, once, once I'd used mine, I wasn't able to replace it. <laughs> <laughs> but that'd be, a, <laughs> that, that'd be a great gift, though, for you know, Chris Kringle's. You could just get, yeah. not, not Gwyneth's one, but the Airwick Dynamic Lifter odour. And then, Carla, you know, if the kids were annoying you, you could say, go mm. to your room, Spray which you've it. already put it all in there and then lock them in and go, oh, you're in there like for an hour. Anyway. Yeah. That smells like shit anyway. <laughs> Teenage boys. Maybe I'm they've sure already got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God. oh, here we go. What about her? This smells like my vagina. There you go. Is it still on sale? What? $75, free shipping. How many did you want? Should we get this one of each of us? funny, gorgeous, <laughs> sexy and beautifully unexpected scent. This candle is made with geranium, citrusy bergamot and cedar absolute. Are you kidding? Just oh, and Just suppose. With damsk rose and I can't read that. Damsk right. rose and ambrette seed to put us in a mind of fantasy, mind of fantasy seduction. seduction and a sophisticated warmth. My mm. vagina does not smell like geranium, citrusy, bergamot. Fuck off. Cedar no, no. juxtaposed with damask rose and ambrette seed, whatever that is. She's full of shit. Oh, she's full of bergamot <laughs> and. <laughs> maybe that. Maybe that's her. That's her other fragrance. <laughs> um, citrusy bergamot and geranium is what she's full of. Anyway. I reckon there are other ones called I'm full of shit. Yeah, it smells <laughs> and that's like what my it asshole. Smells like. Yeah. This candle smells like my asshole. Exactly. <laughs> it's mostly roses. God. Um yes, okay, so yes, I think well, we won't give them the Gwyneth cal- cal- um, candle, but maybe we'll get we'll commission Gwyneth to make one that smells like chicken shit and all sorts of gross things. And we'll yeah. be, and we'll make them have those candles. Yeah. I'm not nice. quite sure why we're going the very it's all about the smell, and I'm not even sure that the chicken place smelled that bad, but Swanee was pretty convinced from day one when I talked about the chicken house. That's all we need. <laughs> now that I can smell, yes. oh, I will change. Oh. I had my checkup yesterday. It's going very well. I'm like, I, it's a whole new world. Um, and, yes, it, I'd have to say that that was my first thought was, why would you, if you were building something, can you have access to materials and you're creative like the doctor and his good man were? Why did they feel it necessary to put? That's my big takeout from the whole murder. <laughs> why did you still put your pink room above your chicken coop? So, it doesn't make sense to it. That's the real crime. For I was going to say, is that why? the crime? And what's the yeah, punishment no, then? Nothing. Nothing <laughs> says sexy time to me like you know Dynamic farm animals lifter. and chicken coop. Exactly. Uh, yeah, you it's should like, see oh, it you up couldn't here. Couldn't separate the two. That's where everyone does it. <laughs> yep. That's why you <laughs> let the chickens out during the day. That's exactly right. That's the real <laughs> crime here. That people didn't have the foresight to. Um, it is word? weird. Separate though. Sexy time with yeah, chicken coop time. Yeah, that is a bit odd. Yeah, don't know that you deserve to be murdered for it. I probably don't think you do, but you know, no, yeah, I'm just saying. it is a strange choice. Yes. Yeah, yeah. especially seeing as they were builders. You know, they were able to. They created their <laughs> dream mini castle or mini mansion. I do wonder when he said, you know, he was just designing and the article says, I'm just sitting here designing my chicken house, whether as he's writing that he's just adding another whip 
or chain to the picture mm. of the pink room at the top, another chicken down the bottom, some more canned goods on the second story and some more pornography oh, yeah. in the corner. It, it, it is, is a strange about, collection um, of things, yes. Mm. But I think that there's something about him and that, I mean, again, it's hard to know, but certainly from the way you've told the stories, it's nearly like a lot of the stuff he does is nearly tongue-in-cheek, but I don't quite understand the design of the, <laughs> the three-story kingdom. I think it's clever that they've done it. But, you know, there's quirky and then there's do you fancy getting it on? It's like, no, I can't concentrate because all I can smell is Also, I, I don't even know about the chickens. The bit that upset me more was the old mattresses in the pink room. Like yeah. if I'm going to have an orgy, I don't want to have it knowing everyone else in town has been on those mattresses, you know. Like Push I'm very funny afterwards. about these things. <laughs> I just I'm, get it. I, you oh. know, I'm a bit, bit mind you, I'm probably wouldn't have an orgy for the same reason that because I'm particular about these things but yeah I just thought I don't know there's something very seedy about that maybe they built yeah. the pink room like a Queenslander and so there was no ground floor <laughs> and it was just, just opportunistic to then put the chickens in well, there put the chicken somewhere at a later just, day yeah, maybe yeah which came first the chicken or the pink room <laughs> I think we did a lot of chicken smells we've done yeah, a winner thing done. are you happy that there's no real sentence except to acknowledge that the crime of bad architecture is the crime of bad architecture. For when me, it comes to yes. putting the pink room yeah. on top of, on top of yeah. a stink. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for okay. sure. All right, well, thank you for joining me on that story. I know it was a bit of a Debbie Downer, but I just did think it was interesting and um, I kind of liked I kind of enjoyed the pink room. Yeah. So Ooh, maybe you'll get an invite one day. Oh, I don't think maybe so. Maybe she it's went up there with some disinfectant and some Glen Twenty. And my own <laughs> maybe it's, maybe a what do you call it, a drop sheet or something. Do you remember when we used to go to um, we'd go to music festivals and I would bring a blow up mattress, <laughs> my own linen. Yes, I do. Do they? You know, I'm very particular. I do. About this I stuff. do. Yeah, yeah. Oh yes, the olden days. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. And as we say every week, miss you already. Ta ta. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Thanks for listening to Trial by Wine. You can contact us at trialbywine at gmail.com. Please rate, review and subscribe to Trial by Wine on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to support us, you can become a patron at www.patreon.com, Trial by Wine. Or visit our website, www.trialbywine.com to donate to us. Your support will help us cover many more cases and apply wacky sentences. We really appreciate you listening and hope you tell everyone about us. Our cover art is by John Christo and music is by Beauchamp from pixabay.com.